Dear friends, good evening. Welcome everyone to our pre-chamber lecture series. And tonight, the subject that we have in store is Atlantis and the Aryan race. This is a wonderful lecture and you will learn so much about the origins of most of the many things that we see that we see today. So as you know, we like to start our lectures in our pre-chamber series with a quote from Master Samuel Omer. And in his Christmas message of the year 1967 to 1968, Samael said, The existence of Atlantis has been thoroughly demonstrated by the true wise ones who have, every now and then, walked amongst us. This is a beautiful statement because we find so many commonalities in the cultures around the world that have an origin in the very ancient Atlantean wisdom of the god Poseidon, of the god Neptune. A good example of this are these two great men that you're seeing on the screen. On the bottom left, we see Atlanteotl. And Atlanteotl appears in the, the, the Codex Borgia. These ancient codices are phenomenal pieces of wisdom. These are books that have been written in, in leather skin. And they have been written in such a way, with symbols and with colors, then with the ancient ones explain them, they would say we would see them and we would even perceive the music that comes with the teaching. So Atlanteotl appears in the Codex Borgia. And in the Aztec culture, in the Maya culture, those names that end in that O-T-L, Otl, that means God. It means deity. It speaks of a great master. And Atlante, well, certainly refers to Atlantis. So Atlanteotl is that god of Atlantis. And notice how he appears here, bearing in his back the weight of the waters of creation. But because... This culture in Mesoamerica started at around 11,000 years before the era of Christ. And at around 3,000 years before the era of Christ, they started uh, agglomerating and, uh, and becoming more of an organized uh, society. They are the predecessors of the figure that you see on the right, which is the Greek god Atlas. Both cultures are looking at the same symbol, the same teaching, the same content. And everything just comes from the very same root. This Atlanteotl, or this great master of Atlantis, this, this, this god of Atlantis, well, it's mentioned, uh, his lands are mentioned in the Temeos of Plato. Plato spoke about this long-lost continent, and it states that the story, the history started on around 355 before the era of Christ, as he wrote this book. Plato referred to Atlantis as this empire that was west of the pillars of Hercules, and he stated in his writings that this was a nation that was established by Poseidon. Well, today we don't have images of what this city may have looked like, but there are some very beautiful artistic renditions. And we, as we were looking for the best images to show you, we came across this image resembling what would be the capital of Atlantis as described by Plato. But Plato mentions Poseidon. And as we observe Poseidon, well, those of you who have been participating with us for many lectures, uh, we, we like to, we like to uh, highlight the symbols and speak about the meaning of the symbols themselves. Well, notice how Poseidon appears with the face of the ancient of days. He has long hair and he has that long beard, and that beard with those curls, usually 13 curls, speak about the ancient of days or the father of our own innermost, of our own spirit. 
Notice that he is holding on to a trident. And this trident with those three tips, those three little spears, are always a symbol of the three primary forces of creation. Those forces being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And depending on where we find ourselves in the world, those three primary figures would be Brahma, Vishnu, or Shiva, or they would be Aurus, Osiris, and Isis. And notice that he is also sitting on a stone, the same stone of the philosophers that is spoken about in those ancient medieval texts of alchemy. So whether we refer to him as Poseidon or Neptune, Notice that we are speaking of the same deity. We are speaking of the same master. And whether we refer to them as gods or deities or masters or angels or devas, we are speaking about the same thing. We're speaking about great masters who work in favor of humanity. So on the left you see Poseidon and on the right you see Neptune. And notice how Neptune is sitting on the bottom picture with his wife. And there's an angel that descends from the heavens and is pouring of a container into their own cups, into their own bowls, their plates. This, of course, is that elixir of long life. It is that superior water that has the ability to transform us. So Poseidon, or Neptune, the times of Atlantis, they spoke of the wisdom of the waters. Atlanteotl carrying the weight of the waters in his shoulders. The Greek Atlas carrying the weight of the world and the water on his shoulders. Well, they are speaking about the same thing. They are letting us know that there is a secret wisdom associated with waters of creation. Waters that exist within every microcosmic man. But speaking about Atlantis... Let's look at what Elena Blavatsky has to say. She wrote in her anthropological stanzas, The third race gave birth to the fourth. The suras became asuras. And those from the third and the fourth grew in their pride, claiming we are the kings, we are as gods. And they built great cities. And the waters submerged the seven islands. The worthy were saved and the unworthy destroyed. Now the third race is the great Lemurian race. This is a race that existed in the long lost continent of Mu, west of what is now South America. The fourth race is the Atlantean race. Civilization that existed in a lost mass that <laughs> sunk within the waters of what is now the Atlantic Ocean. And when Blavatsky speaks about suras and the suras, when she uses this word, suras means gods. It means masters. It means great men, true humans, people who had developed a perfect balance between their spirit, whom... And their mind, manas, whom manas or humans. And they became asuras. A, as a prefix, means not. So the gods lost their divinity. The great men fell, just as the stories that we have seen on the, on the exit of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. And she continues by saying, the fifth race was all created from the holy stem and was governed by divine kings. She speaks now of us. We who are all part of this Aryan race, the fifth great race. And she says that we in the beginning were governed by divine kings, by great masters who were able to survive some kind of catastrophe. And they came to bring that wisdom. And so she continues by saying, And the serpents returned and made peace with the men of the fifth. And they educated and instructed them. Those serpents 
are not just serpents that crawl, but she is referring to those masters who knew about the great mysteries of fire. Those ancient mysteries that came to be taught later by the Babylonians and the schools of Mithra and the ancient schools of Egyptian mysteries and the Druids and the Mayas and the Chaldeans, etc. These are referred to as serpents because they spoke of working with an internal fire, a fire that is known as the fire of Kundalini. A fire that when awakens and becomes liberated looks like a serpent of fire within the constitution of man. And she refers to them as serpents because those masters who came to work were masters of perfection. They were devoured by the serpent because they were able to eliminate every inferior aspect within them and as a consequence, this divine fire flourished within each and every one of them. About this particular story that Blavatsky speaks, there is a translation of a Maya manuscript that is part of the collection of Le Flongion and Troano manuscripts that exist in the British Museum. And the translation says, In the year of Sixkan, 11 Muluk, in the month of Serg, terrible earthquakes occurred, which continued without interruption until 13 Xuan, the country of the mud hills, the land of Mu, was sacrificed. And after two shocks, it disappeared during the night, being constantly shaken by subterranean fires that caused the earth to sink and reappear several times and in various places. At last, the surface gave way and ten countries separated and disappeared. They sank 64 million inhabitants 8,000 years before this book was written. We see the Maya teaching being used several times. And we see this teaching associated with not only this long lost event that is even mentioned in the book of Genesis. But Master Samael Unveor, speaking about the Maya wisdom, he comes to tell us <clears throat> that the great Master Jesus spoke in Maya that he, at the moment of being crucified, as part of his final words, he uttered words of wisdom that were part of a very ancient Maya tradition, of a Maya practice, perhaps a mystical practice. And he said, Eli Eli Lama Sabatani, which has a very profound meaning. Because as he exhales his last breath, well, the translation of that is, Father, I now lose myself at the preamble of your presence. We share this with you because as we transition here in this virtual historical tour for, through the lands of Lhasa in Tibet, here in Tibet we come across some very interesting teachings and writings that are associated both to this global event and also to the teachings of the great master Jesus. Specific to this particular event associated to Atlantis, there is an ancient Chaldean inscription that reads, when the star of Baal fell into place where now there is only sea and sky, that is the area of the Atlantic Ocean, the seven cities with their golden gates and transparent temples trembled and trembled like the leaves of a tree shaken by a storm. But it says more. It says, And behold, a billow of fire and smoke rose from the palaces. The screams of agony from the multitude filled the air. 
they sought refuge in their temples and citadels of the wise man, Mu. The priest of Ramu appeared and said to them, Did I not predict this to you? And the men and women covered with precious stones and shining garments cried out by saying, Mu, save us! And Mu replied, You will die with your slaves and your riches. And from your ashes new nations will arise. And if they, referring to us as this new nation, this new race, and if they forget that they must be superior, not by what they acquire, but by what they give, the same fate will befall them. And flame and smoke drowned the words of the master. And the land shattered and sank with its inhabitants into the depths of the sea in just a few months. This Atlantean catastrophe is well explained as that story of the universal flood in the book of Genesis. So notice that we come across the same teaching from many different sources. But it all has a very similar, single origin. To this, Samael says, upon reaching these depths of etymology, the studying of the origin of all these words, the soul of history, and one of the most powerful keys of Gnosis, we could never stop remembering that famous phrase of the Maya ritual language that literally says, Heli Eli Lama Sabachthani. And that the four evangelists interpret esoterically in four different ways. In an extraordinary way, the great Kabir, he's speaking about the great master Jesus, pronounced such a phrase on the majestic summit of the Calvary. Now I immerse in the pre-dawn of your presence is undoubtedly the meaning in the Maya language. Now, as we were sharing this uh, a few years ago, uh, there was a student who said, you know, this is so interesting, but I don't find anything that says that Jesus knew Maya. I don't find anything that says that Jesus was anywhere where he would be learning these new things. So we continue doing much of our homework. And we would like to complement the teaching of Samael with the writings of Nicholas Norovic. He wrote a book that is titled The Unknown Life of Jesus Christ. And this is a book, well, that was uh, written in, the, in 1894. Here, he provides an account of his, uh, of his adventure as he is learning from the Hindu, uh, from the Buddhists, as he is traveling those lands back in the 19th century. And in this particular book, as he comes across one of the chief lamas of the Hemis Monastery, the lama tells Nicholas, the original scrolls brought from India to Nepal and from Nepal to Tibet, relating to the life of Isa, this is how they referred to the great master Yeshua ben Pandira, are written in the Pali language and are actually in Lhasa. But a copy in our language, Tibetan, is in this convent. As part of their conversation, Nicholas asks this chief lama about Jesus. And he says, how is Isa, Jesus, looked upon in Tibet? Has he the repute of a saint? And the chief lama replied by saying, the people are not even aware he existed. Only the principal lamas who know him through having studied the scrolls in which his life is related are familiar with his name. And this speaks very specifically about the time of that esoteric or occult aspect of the life of Jesus. So you have an idea of what is contained in these particular scrolls. It says, in his 14th year, by the time he was 14 years old, the young Isa, the Blessed One, came this side of the sins and settled among the areas. 
in the country beloved by God. Fame spread the name of the marvelous youth, and when he came through the country of the five streams, the devotees of the god Jai asked him to stay among them. But he left the deluded worshippers of Jai and went to Jagarnath in the country of Orsis, where the white priests of Brahma welcome him joyfully. They taught him to read and to understand the Vedas, to cure physical ills by means of prayers. He spent six years in Jagarnath. The common people loved Isa, for he lived in peace with the Vaisyas and the Sudras, to whom he taught the Holy Scriptures. And this is what Jesus was doing at the age of 14. There is so much more good content. But because this is just for information, and this is not part of this wisdom of Gnosis at Samael and Vils, we're going to just set this aside and leave the curiosity to you, the students, if you would like to learn a little bit more. But let's go back to this subject matter of Atlantis, because we see that there are many, many, many analogies. And, for example, when referring to the deity, to God, we see that it is referred to as Dios in Spanish, or Dio in French, or Deus in Latin. It is the Chinese Tao. It is the Teotl of the Nawas. There is common wisdom here. Same thing happened with those concepts of the mother and the father that we refer to so often in terms of the Divine Mother and our Divine Father who is in secret. Whether we refer to it as father or pater or vader or padre or pa, we know that that is the father. When it comes to the mother, whether we say mer or mother or madre, maya, or we say mater, we are always referring to the same. So notice that this wisdom comes to us. And as we receive it, we have an opportunity to capitalize on these many commonalities, to extract the wisdom that is available to us. Dr. Paul Schliemann, he wrote a book titled How I Found the Lost Atlantis. And in his works, he speaks about the lost treasure of Priam that he came across in Troy. And he narrates in his writings that he came across a vase with an inscription that literally read, from the king Kronos of Atlantis, and that this was written in Phoenician characters. And there were similar vases that were found in Tlalmahuaca, in Central America, in the lands of the Mexica. Also, many coins that were minted, stamped, as issued at the temples of the transparent walls, coins that were found in many jars. And to this day, well, this article that we share here, well, it dates back almost 20 years ago, November of 2005. But it speaks about an American archaeological team that spoke about a discovery of what they referred to as definitive evidence of an underwater ancient harbor remains that exist at two separate locations at Bimini. And they say stone anchors identical to ancient Phoenician, Greek, and Roman anchors were also found in this location. So this is, of course, of such interest. Even the great Eliot Scott, as he crafted uh, his, uh, his, uh, his mapping work, well, he shows on a map in which he outlined the world as was best known at the time, and he highlighted what areas were then above water and below water some 800,000 years before the era of Christ. Hopefully you can appreciate some of the detail of this map on your screen. But notice that we have highlighted areas on the northern hemisphere where water is very prevalent. What is now known as most of Europe and Siberia, the Bering Strait, 
France, Germany, Scandinavia. Much of this was back then underwater. Notice that in what is Africa today, to the northeastern corner of Africa, there is an evident mass of land that was above water, and that is the ancient lands of Graonchi that are identified as those original lands where these first humans of this fifth race uh, started emerging. And then, notice how towards the south, well, South America, and also back again to the north, Canada, Alaska, parts of North America, were still all submerged. Notice how this mass of land is fairly continuous. There is a consistent path that you can see that will take you from one side of the world to the next one, aligning beautifully to this concept of the original Pangea, just a single mass of land on the earth. But of course, with the geophysical changes that the planet has gone, certainly, well, it would not be of surprise to anyone to see that some of these lands have submerged while others have emerged from the waters. So let's go ahead and speak a little a bit more about the science and the culture and uh, the art and the other things that are of interest of Atlantis. Atlantis existed on what is today the Atlantic Ocean. Geophysical changes led to the disappearance of this, and those geophysical phenomena are mentioned in the Aztec Stone of the Sun. In this Aztec calendar, there is a very peculiar glyph that exists on the bottom right-hand corner of the face of Tonatiu. If you ever see the Aztec calendar, you will notice that on the very center there is an image of the Ancient of Days. You will see the face of this old man with wrinkles under his eyes, opening his mouth and the tongue of flint extending from his mouth to indicate that divinity creates with the power of the word the same thing that the Apostle John writes in his Gospel. And to the bottom right-hand corner, we see that there is a rain of a fire of water, which is Atonatiu. This son of water is that particular event that manifested on the earth that led to the submergence of this continent. In the very same way, there is Coahuitul Tonatiu, there is Ocelotul Tonatiu, etc., which are the previous eras, periods that brought to an end the first three races that existed. In, on earth. This particular catastrophe that brings to its demise the land of Atlantis, well, it did not manifest overnight. There was a first catastrophe that took place roughly around 800,000 years before the era of Christ. And then there was a second catastrophe that took place around 200,000 years before the era of Christ. And then a last event that is the one mentioned in all of these passages we have been seeing today that happened around 11,000 years before the era of Christ. Dear friends, this event is the great flood that Moses speaks of in the book of Genesis. This universal deluge is exactly this particular event that the Aztecs referred to as Atonatiu on the stone of the sun. And there is an author who is sharing this as complimentary information because this is not a book of Gnosis. But there is an author named John White who wrote a very interesting book titled The Pole Shift. And in his book, White speaks of glacial ages. He speaks about pole shifting. He speaks about scripts, wisdom that is captured within the crypts of the Lamas, ancient maps, geographical charts that speak of Atlantis. He was able to source many of these discoveries that exist documented, well documented within the Library of Congress, and he speaks of findings, archaeological findings that are of a remarkable nature. 
that <laughs> if, as they become public, they will they will be in conflict with the existing numbers, timelines, and theories that speak about the origins of man. Nevertheless, a very interesting book. But again, he speaks about ancient maps and he speaks of these geographical charts. What do we know about the Atlanteans? We know that in terms of their physicality, they were very different from us. Today, the average height, depending on where you stand in the world, could be anything uh, close be between five and a half to six feet of height. But the typical Atlantean was of around three meters in height. And three meters is closer to nine feet. Those who existed before the Atlanteans were certainly giants of a greater stature. And those giants in the lands of Mu, root race of the Atlantean, well, they were even taller, 15, 17 feet tall. But the Atlanteans, just like the previous three root races, also went through four particular eras, four particular ages. Same thing that has happened to us as the Aryan race. They went first through an era of gold. And the era of gold is an era of splendor of any humanity. In an era of gold, there is direct contact with divinity. Man has all of its internal faculties and abilities active. There is direct communication between those beings and those divine beings that exist in higher levels of consciousness, in those superior dimensions of nature. But... Moved by the laws of evolution and involution, which are two sister laws that keep all cycles of action in motion, they transition from an era of gold to an era of silver. And in the era of silver, we start seeing the emergence of the ego. Those humanities still have their faculties and their abilities. They can still communicate with beings from superior realms of creation but different than in the era of gold where there is no distinction between what is mine and what is yours. No distinction between my land and your land, between my country and your country. In the era of silver, we start seeing those initial conflicts. As the ego continues to harden, they transition into an era of copper. This era of copper, well, it starts showing that there are fallen humans. Humans who start losing their abilities. Humans who become disconnected from their innermost. This is identical to the story that we see in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve were expelled from that paradise. And as that degeneration continues, conflict increases. Now we start seeing wars. Now we start seeing bloodshed. Now we start seeing the use of superior abilities for dark purposes. And then we get into the era of iron. And the era of iron is always known as the era of the goddess Kali. Kali, just like Ekate, just like Proserpina, well, is an aspect of the Divine Mother, the third aspect. And she is terror of love and law. Kali is the goddess of the underworld. And thus, the era of Kali, or the Kali Yuga, is the Iron Age of every civilization. This Iron Age is the one in which we exist today. But as they walked down their path of evolution and involution, the Atlanteans were able to come up with phenomenal advancements in the medical, in the technological, in many different fields. They had the ability to work with atomic energy, just as we have the ability to work with the atomic energy today. They had the ability to work with the transplants of organs from one body onto the next one, same as we have the ability to perform those phenomenal medical feats today. They were versed and they were familiar with traveling outside of the planet with their ships, just as we have some limited ability to do that today. 
And in terms of aesthetics and beauty, they loved nature and they loved gardens and they had an appreciation for the, 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 the creation as many of God, as many of us hold today within our hearts. But a little different back then is that there were different creatures used for different purposes. You can see here a beautiful image of Cybele, and she is being pulled in a chariot of gold, but what is pulling her are two great lions. Lions at the times of Atlantis were domesticated. Well, today we don't have that, but we have, of course, horses. And among the Atlanteans, those wise men, as we learned earlier about the great master, Ramu, well, those great wise men were part of a society. It was called the Alcaldana Society. And these men were speaking in epicene terms, men including both men and women. These wise men, well, they educated their people and provided the wisdom that was shared in the equivalent of what would be today's universities. They were very familiar with hermetic astrology. And they would receive the new creatures and be able to read the influence of the stars and help those creatures identify their vocations. So, as they came onto the earth, assuming these physical forms, that they would be able to satisfy the mission of their being. That they would be able to collaborate and sacrifice for their, for their social groups, for their families, and always for the betterment and the benefit. Of others. Atlanteans also knew about robotics. And what we have today with machine learning and artificial intelligence, and as of late, thanks to those experts at opening AI, the many different flavors of GPT, well, they also were able to bring an intelligence into their robotics but different than us, that it is an intelligence that is artificial and that it is based on, on algorithms and software, they were able to transplant the soul of plants, the elementals of plants, and move them from the body in which they existed as a plant and, and grant them this new artificial body of this robot. And these became servants in many opulent homes. And similar to what we have today with an Alexa device or whatever other electronic device we may have, these particular mechanical servants with the soul of an elemental of nature would provide them information about weather conditions, about impending disasters, about things that they should take care of. But not everything was splendor and beauty. Because they learned to you to make use of the atomic energy. Well, eventually they used that atomic energy for nefarious purposes, just as we humans have done. John White, in his writings, in his book The Pole Shift, he speaks about an archaeological finding in the lands between the Tigris and Euphrates River, where several meters below grade level that there is a layer of glass made from that sand. And at first, when discovered, they believed that it could have been just the impact of lightning that creates this uh, strange serpentine pattern that where the sand melts and crystallizes. But as they further investigated, it is a layer of glass that is the typical result of exposing sand to exceedingly high temperatures, as you would see in something like a nuclear detonation. So the Atlanteans were involved in these concepts of mass destruction and war. As they degenerated, well, many of them became cannibals. As those sacrifices were made in many temples, well, those... Poor creatures were sacrificed, their blood was spilled, their organs were harvested to be able to be transplanted somewhere else, and the bodies were tossed to the multitudes, and they would take those bodies and eat them under the belief 
that they would be receiving the essence of that young soul, that they would benefit from that. And cannibalism was part of their degeneration. But all of this degeneration eventually has to stop. And the very same event where Ramu is telling them, didn't I tell you that this was going to happen? Well, Manu Vaivasvata, the great biblical Noah, he was one of those indicating these are the times of the end. There is a change that we must affect within ourselves. There is a hidden wisdom that we must put into practice. There is an internal transformation that we all must embrace. But similar to these days, where people listen to such advice and they laugh, or they reject it, they think it's silly, unnecessary. The same thing happened. And eventually, the catastrophe arrived, and those who did not listen, well, they perished. The Atlanteans, as we know, became a fallen civilization. There was profanity of religion. The name of God was used for many purposes except divine purposes. There was abuse of the sexuality just as much as we can perceive and evidence. The abuse of sexuality that we see today among us humanoids. The capital sins were there rampant just as today well we all carry within all of these elements of not only anger and vengeance and rancor but ambitions and greed and envies and lusts and laziness and prides etc two men who existed back in atlantis of name macari cromversion and another one armanitora they initiated a movement that helped create a, a chasm, a split within the minds of Atlanteans. They developed these concepts of good and evil, of good and bad, furthering any concepts that existed at the moment and furthering developing those concepts to create divisiveness, separateness, something that exists so much today, whether it is economical or political or religious, etc. They used to have a queen in Atlantis of name Ketabel. And this queen Ketabel was known as the queen of the, of the dark mysteries. A beautiful queen that, even though as old as she was, maintained her splendorous beauty. Because she was constantly getting from those organs, from those children and virgins who were sacrificed and transplanting those, those glands into her body to maintain her beauty. Of course, this all led to black magic. Use of faculties for dark, nefarious purposes. And whether it was homosexualism or alcohol or vices, they all existed. And what we see today is a reflection in our current time as that of the times of Atlantis. Speaking about the end of days of the Atlanteans, there was a catastrophic war. And with that war, the arrival also of the planet Hercolibus induced a shifting of the poles. That shifting of the poles triggered that universal flood. And we already learned about the words of the great prophet Ramu. He said, you will perish with your women, with your children, and your slaves. And if the future race follows your path, so too they will perish. But not everyone died. There were some who were able to endure and survive the catastrophe, and they remained as savages out in the land. But there were others, a select few, who were spared from the catastrophe itself. We see this very clearly in the story of Noah. They walk into a symbolic ark, and this ark allows them to navigate these stormy waters. 
Well, those who were spared from the catastrophe are all those who embrace the wisdom, all those who worked intensely upon themselves and were able to eliminate most of those psychological aggregates and they were taken to a safe haven so they could continue working and become the seed for the next race. All of those survivors were taken to the lands of Gravonchi. And there, the great men of the Alcaldana society, well, they migrated to Egypt. In the writings of the great Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great god Ibis of Toth, he states that he is called upon the presence of the seven. And he descends into the halls of Amenti, and the great masters, the lords of creation, tell him, take your men and your ships and go to those lands and educate those men. Those are these men who migrated into those lands of Egypt. And Hermes states that when they get there, they conquered the savages with their wisdom. So they once again established the new version of the Alcaldana Society as this university. There was the Sphinx created to symbolize the path of self-realization, to speak about the virtues, and there were temples of astrology where horoscopes were, were read to the peoples, not in the way that we read horoscopes today from a magazine, but understanding the archetypes that exist behind all of those celestial bodies, constellations, etc. These great men, they help plan weddings, <laughs> they help plan uh, the development of children, and they helped educate them so that they would satisfy their vocations. And the Inca, the Maya, the Egyptian religions, others, are an extension of those primitive religions of Neptune, of Poseidon, from the lands of Atlantis. The descendants of the Atlanteans are the Maya. The Maya, well, they migrated to Tibet, to Egypt, to Central America. Back then, the configuration of the, the surface of the planet was different. And so, we find the Maya language used in many sacred rituals at Tibet. We have already learned from Master Samael Onveor the words of the great master as he is crucified when he says, Eli Eli Lama Sabachthani. The great master Jesus, as it has been written in one of those monasteries in Lhasa, was said that Jesus became the most proficient master to ever walk the face of the earth. And now that we spoke about the Atlanteans and we spoke about their end, well, now that we are here in this fifth Aryan race, it is important that we all know that every race has an expression. And the expression of such race, any race, is of giving birth to seven sub-races. Our Aryan seed is of a Nordic nature, but from there, sub-races emerge from their pairing with Atlantean survivors. And we see the first sub-race, and it crystallized in that plateau of Central Asia. Then we see a second sub-race as time continues its march. And this one, we see its evidence in the pre-Vedic and the Hindustan splendors. There's a third sub-race that manifested in the Egyptian, Persian, Chaldean, Babylonian mysteries. There is a fourth root race that we see in Greece and Rome. A fifth root race that came to be at the times of Germany, England, and other countries as they manifested their splendor. And then a six-root race that manifested itself at the times of the Spaniards and those interactions with the Indo-Americans. Now, the seventh root race, which is the final one, is this cultural melting pot that we are experiencing in North America, particularly in the USA. 
but there are only seven. And this indicates that here in this great fifth Aryan race, you and me, our children, our grandchildren who are growing up, we are all part of the last sub-race of this great race. And all of the great masters have spoken about the end of times. They have all spoken about the need for us to embrace a change. This is commonly known as <laughs> the, the change that the world needs is in you to also more profound teachings from schools of regeneration that speak about bringing about the birth of virtues by eliminating what is unworthy in you. And of course, the sacrifice for others. Secret, secret teachings that speak about working with a hidden power that exists within you. Creative waters that when you transform them, they have the ability to bring about and materialize faculties, powers, abilities, bodies, laws. All of these things that together make up a radiant solar soul, not a lunar soul that is ghost-like like the one that we have today. And this should invite us to reflect on our current condition. Samael says, his best, says it's best when he says, we are currently living our seven sub-race, and this is worthy of reflection. So, dear friends, this is what we wanted to share with you tonight. This lecture has been Atlantis and the Aryan Race. Thank you, everyone, for giving us an opportunity to spend this time with you. To everyone, have a good evening, and may all beings be happy. Have a good night.